welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew Morrill. I'm the Professor and Chair of Academic Programs here. And on behalf of uh, our director, uh, Dr. Susan Weber, I'd like to uh, welcome you um, to uh, this year's uh, International Majorica Society of America Lecture. Um, it's an event, I have to say, that's now firmly interwoven into the rhythms of our academic year. Uh, May comes round and everybody appears. And so it's become a, a very lovely event that we uh, look forward to, and uh, we welcome many of the members of the society here and others from the general public. Um, the lecture series, as you probably know, honours um, Joan Stack Graham, who is a founding member of the society, um, and co-author, of course, of Majolica, A Complete History of Illustrated Survey. Um, and not at all. Good. Uh, <laughs> um, and, um, you know, we're uh, grateful um, that the lectureship is actually found, funded uh, by a grant from members of the society. i uh, particularly like to thank um, Phil and Deborah English uh, for their own benefactions to us. So it gives me a special pleasure um, this evening to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, Dr. Laura McCrulis is a very long-standing member of the BGC family. Um, she, after a career in Wall Street, extraordinarily, uh, she came here as <laughs> the first entering class uh, of the MA program in 1993. Um, <laughs> uh, which is, which is a lot of um, she finished that and then served for a number of years um, on the BGC um, Executive Planning Committee, and then uh, began a PhD uh, dissertation with us here, uh, which she finished in 2016, I think, with a dissertation entitled In Pursuit of Art Manufacture, The Business and Design History of Gillow and Company, 1862 to 1897, British Furniture Makers and Interior Decorators. Um, and so has become, through this, very much an expert on uh, late 19th century British, European, indeed American design. Uh, and um, she has published uh, articles in furniture history, in uh, studies in the decorative arts, in, in uh, antiques magazine, on uh, furniture design of this period, and design history, and has taught courses on uh, the theme in uh, FIT and NYU. Um, and so she is currently, uh, very excitedly, uh, a research associate with us here at the BGC, uh, and is, of course, working very closely with Susan on the Majolica exhibition, forthcoming in 2020. And this is the fruits of her, I think, very raw, uh, you know, <laughs> newly excavated research uh, that we're going to hear a taste of today uh, on American Majolica, um, new discoveries in American Majolica. Please welcome Dr. Laura, Laura McCoy. <laughs> opportunity to learn something new every single day and the opportunity to really dig deeply into a topic with so much potential for new discovery. I'm thrilled to be here tonight to share a bit with you about what I've been up to over the past several months in preparation for our Majelica exhibition. <coughs> um, as Andrew mentioned, it's scheduled to open at the Walters Art Museum in um, about two years from now, in uh, the spring of 2020, and here at the Bard Graduate Center in the fall of 2020. 
So in the course of photographing lots of broken Majelica plates, <laughs> pots, and pictures, and reading other people's mail in various <laughs> archives <laughs> across the Eastern <laughs> Coast, and searching through decades worth of uh, 19th century trade journals and newspapers, I can report that we have made some really interesting discoveries um, relating to American Majolica, both in terms of design and production. And to be clear, some of these discoveries are actually just refinements of old scholarship or clarifications of facts that hadn't previously been critically examined. Um, but taken together, we have a much more comprehensive view of um, American-made Majolica than we had, say, even six months ago. This evening, I'll be showing you some research highlights that basically focus on three different potteries. Uh, the Harrison Peekskill Pottery uh, in Peekskill, New York, the Arsenal Pottery in Trenton, New Jersey, and the Eureka Pottery also in Trenton. Mm -hmm. To the extent possible, I hope to share a bit with you about the research process, um, the surprises, <coughs> the dead ends, as well as the questions that still remain. But before we get into any details, I think it's probably a good idea to review what exactly we mean by the term Angelica. The term was originally coined by the Staffordshire Pottery, Minton and Company, to describe a colorfully glazed earthenware that had been introduced by the firm at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851. These wares were generally referred to as having been, quote, colored in the style of old Majolica. In other words, Minton Majolica took its inspiration from the Italian Renaissance Majolica which was basically an earthenware body dipped in a white opaque glaze, dry, and then painted with metallic oxide pigments, which actually look like this. For our purposes this evening, we will simply consider Majolica as molded earthenware, typically colored with bright, brightly uh, colored lead glazes, produced in the second half of the 19th century. And I wonder if anyone can recognize whose collection this would be. <laughs> <coughs> the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, held in 1876, is often cited as the first major exposure that Americans had to English Majolica. But we know from period newspapers that Majolica was actually being marketed in New York as early as 1868 and sold more widely in Boston, Chicago, <coughs> and Philadelphia in, um, throughout the early 1870s. At the Philadelphia Centennial, A.B. Daniel and Son, a high-end London retailer of pottery, porcelain, and glass, took a stand in the main exhibition building to display a variety of contemporary English ware. We've discovered that over the course of the exhibition, Daniel shipped over 225 pieces of Majolica to Philadelphia for display and potential sale. This photo shows the densely arranged, sort of over the top side of, of 19th century taste. And while not all of this material that Daniel, <coughs> that Daniel showed was Majolica, enough of it was to have made a really big impression. And I've just highlighted a few mm -hmm. choice Minton examples here. The colorful passion flower garden seat, a jardinier with molded leaves <coughs> on either side, um, and the large jardinier on the far uh, right um, with portrait medallions and molded ram's heads, modeled by one of uh, Minton's chief designers, the sculptor Ernest uh, carrier Bellows. And in another stereoscopic view of Daniel's stand, in the foreground, uh, there's a pair of large shell and coral jardinere, um, mm -hmm. flanked by two <coughs> jardinere in the Chinese taste, described as being uh, glazed in Persian blue and imperial yellow. Mm -hmm. And in the back on the right, um, there's a Renaissance revival, uh, sorry, left, 
cistern um, in the so-called Della Robbia style, probably designed by Pierre Emile Genest, mm. another prominent modeler uh, employed by Minton. Later, we will return to the uh, Centennial Exhibition in another context. But let's just say that after 1876, both American consumers and producers were very inspired by what they saw. The few American potters that exhibited in Philadelphia could clearly see the commercial potential of this new ware. And indeed, James Carr of the New York City Pottery, Jeffords of Philadelphia, and the Glasgow Pottery of Trenton all showed early versions of Majolica. <coughs> So who were these potters? In many cases, they were English-born and trained, seeking to capitalize on their craft expertise in exchange for potential fortunes, or at the very least, uh, better working conditions, better living conditions. During the 1840s, the towns that comprised the Staffordshire potteries um, experienced a major recession. This, in turn, prompted a sustained period of emigration by skilled English potters. Many settled in uh, East Liverpool, Ohio, and Trenton, New Jersey, two regions that would come to dominate American ceramics production at the end of the 19th century. In fact, of East Liverpool's total population in 1850, almost 32% were English-born. Richard Harrison was one of these immigrant potters who would later emerge as the proprietor of the Peekskill Pottery, maker of tenuous Majolica. Harrison is well worth examining, as his, the details of his early career definitely come under the heading of new discoveries. We have recently learned that Richard Harrison trained in England and was settled in East Liverpool by 1848. Although the details remain sketchy, and frankly speaking, even finding Harrison at all in East Liverpool was a bit of serendipity, an East Liverpool historian had documented that Richard Harrison and a Richard Henderson partnered together to produce Rockingham for about two or three years, but nothing further was known about him. <coughs> Rockingham is an inexpensive, molded earthenware finished with brown glaze, which was made throughout the 19th century. And it is important to our story tonight because many of the American Majolica producers initially produced Rockingham before transitioning to the more complicated Majolica glazes, which required much more careful firing. Harrison's hound-handled pictures are shown in the image on the left, along with his impressed maker's mark on the right. Now, the exact nature of the partnership between Henderson and Harrison is still a bit of a mystery. Um, but given that Harrison's name is on the maker's mark alone, it could well have been that Henderson's role was simply <coughs> just providing capital for, for the pottery. This inkwell, with its molded <coughs> Chinese scholar figures, also is marked by Harrison. And it strikes me as a relatively sophisticated design. Potters arriving in East Liverpool were forced to be very adaptable. Those with specialized skills found that in order to stay in business, they, were, they would have to perform a variety of different tasks. Um, everything from modeling to mold making to glazing to pressing. And it's my assumption that um, Harrison was an all-around practical potter with a high degree of craft skill and artistry, as well as a bit of chemi chemistry thrown in, probably <coughs> learned on the job. After a short run in East Liverpool, Harrison and family turned up in New York City. By the mid-1860s, uh, his wife had established a crockery and glass store in Westchester County. And finally, at 60 years of age, and nearly 30 years after he had his pottery in East Liverpool, Ohio, Richard Harrison established a new pottery on North Broad Street with a single kiln. Um, and I'm going to show you exactly where that is. Right here. The kiln is the, the pink circle. Um, 
And here, at this modest site, is where he made uh, a, a range of useful majolica wares with the maker's mark of tenuous majolica. Um, the butter pat on the uh, right is just a small example with what I like to call a, an abstract tree of life motif. <laughs> there is very little documentation on this pottery, but we have ascertained through the Dunn credit reports that the business grew gradually, achieved some financial success, and appears to have reached its peak production sometime in the late 1880s. It was at that time that Harrison had about 18 people working for him, one of which was his son, and um, five females, who presumably were the decorators of the Majolica. These teapots are amongst my favorite of the Peekskill pottery, and they show the, the wonderful quirkiness of the designs, um, the juxtaposition of the scaly dragon head motif, or I'm not really even sure what it is, um, with the kale lilies is just not a combination <coughs> one normally pairs together, but in my opinion, it somehow works. Um, Majolica produced by the Peekskill pottery is distinguished in part <coughs> by its dynamic use of naturalistic forms. Um, I think that you can see this in this sort of wonderfully potted uh, leaf plate. Um, it resembles sea kelp in a way with its undulating edges. And the same form obviously is, is shown on the teapot. Overall, I would say that the peak skill uh, designs are refreshingly original. Um, given that it was such a small operation, it's my assumption that Harrison uh, himself may have may have actually been responsible for the modeling, as he may have been in East Liverpool. And even though the family owned a crockery and glass shop, where he would have had easy access to the most current ceramic designs from which to copy, <coughs> the Peekskill Majolica, by and large, is not derivative. Um, given the objects that survive, um, it appears that, that Harrison <coughs> worked with a fairly limited uh, design vocabulary and I'm just going to touch on a few of these, um, these words. <coughs> this leaf plate um, with its molded feathers <coughs> and, 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 are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> and wispy linear decoration shows the, the pastel <coughs> range of Peekskill's glaze colors. And occasionally these glazes are speckled and mottled um, and uh, I suspect that was not done purposely, but rather as a product of experimentation or um, just imprecise glaze formulations. <coughs> Naturalistic shells are another prominent design component of Majolica, obviously, and <coughs> of peak skill wear in particular. Um, the abstract scallop shells and little snail shells are used to great effect in, in Harrison's wares. And I think you can see the mustard pots on the right, again, employ an unexpected combination. The bases of the pots ha are encircled with leaves, and then he uses little, little shells as, as handles in a finial. And then there's this, which obviously you've seen before. Um, <laughs> it's such an expressive, uh, depiction of the shell form, rendered in what appears to be overlapping layers of scallops with little pieces of coral sprinkled throughout. I think it's really, just really stunning. These particular pieces strike me as quintessentially American, <coughs> although wares with, with corn cobs as the primary decorative focus were made by a number of English potteries for the American market. Um, of the known designs produced by Peekskill, this bread tray uh, is one of the few that may have been inspired by an English source, a close model being this platter by the uh, mm -hmm. Staffordshire firm of Adams and Bromley. Although you can see that this design is much more static and controlled than Harrison's version. Here are the layers of corn framing the interior wicker work almost look as if they're folded or wrapped around the edge. This particular piece also happens 
to be the so-called Rosetta Stone of the Harrison <laughs> Pottery Works. Uh, I don't know if you can read the, the mark, but it says Harrison's Peekskill <coughs> Pottery Works, New York. And there is another bread tray of this exact design that has the tenuous stamp. So it's this uh, definitively uh, connects the tenuous mark to Harrison in Peekskill. And one more point I would like to address um, is the somewhat unusual maker's mark that uh, Harrison chose to use on his Majolica, the word tenuous. And I was wondering if he had perhaps an ironic sense of humor, or if um, it was just a commentary on the unstable nature of the pottery industry, or something else entirely. <laughs> and believe me, I've given a lot of thought to this. And without making any wild, unsubstantiated assertions, I would like to suggest that the definition of tenuous in modern American English, quote, having little substance or strength, flimsy or weak, may not be the message that Harrison had intended. For what it's worth, tenuous in 19th century British English is defined a bit differently. Definition number two, I hope you can all read it. Um, we're, it's a little bit dark, so. We can read it. We, we okay. can read it. Definition number two, I believe, may be relevant for our purposes. It reads, rare, subtle, not dense. Perhaps Harrison was being literal. Earthenware, after all, is porous, not dense. And furthermore, as he was such a small-scale maker, and as collectors in this room can attest, his wares were and continue to be relatively rare. Rare, excuse me. Harrison produced Majolica for almost 15 years, but ultimately turned to the production of stove tiles and fire brick in an attempt to make ends meet. The pottery then closed around 1896. From the Hudson Valley, we traveled to Trenton, New Jersey, which was at one time referred to as the Staffordshire of America. Like most industrial hubs, the city was strategically located with easy access to a regional network of rail and water transportation and close proximity to Philadelphia and New York City. This panoramic map from 1874 shows the very elaborate system of canals that supported Trenton's extensive industrial development during the 19th century. To further place the centrality of Trenton's ceramics industry into context, consider the interior of the City Hall Council Chamber, which features a floor-to-ceiling mural painted by the celebrated Ashcan School artist Everett Shin. Here we have a dramatic depiction of men at work in two of the city's most prominent industries, the Roebling Steel Mill is depicted in the left-hand portion of the mural, and the Matic Pottery Works is shown in the detail on the right. The artists describe the subject matter as, quote, the grand and glorious work that makes city and city hall possible. By the end of the 20th century, Trenton boasted 39 potteries with 236 kilns. And the Arsenal Pottery, founded by Joseph S. Mayer, was one of them. Mayer embodied the quintessential American rags to riches story. He was born in Newcastle upon Tyne in 1846, and one newspaper, one newspaper account reported that he, quote, began life in a pottery when a mere lad. By 1870, he had immigrated to the United States settled in Trenton, and presumably found work as a journeyman potter. Six years later, in 1876, Mayer established a pottery fitted with one kiln at the southwest corner of Third and Temple Streets for the production of rocking and wear. Oh, we're ready. Sorry, can't see. <laughs> <laughs> right here. The property was sited with the Delaware River to the west and the Delaware uh, and Raritan Canal to the east, just 
south of the state arsenal, which is here. Hence the name, mm. Arsenal Pottery. Mm. <laughs> the image on the left is an ad that Mayor placed in the Trenton City Directory one year <coughs> after starting the business. I'm showing this because I think it provides a glimpse into Mayor's personality, his confidence, his sort of fake it to you make it type of attitude. We know from the Dunn Credit Reports that he had very limited means, and yet he presents himself and his business as an unmitigated success. He states that, quote, it will not be long before this pottery will rank among the foremost in the city. I think there's a lesson there. Um, <laughs> Self-belief can be very powerful, for the Arsenal pottery did, in fact, achieve this stature. The Rockingham picture on the right is a rare survival from Mayer's first years of production. Joseph's brother, James, joined him in the business by 1879, supplying a much needed infusion of capital. In the detail in the map on the left, you can see that the site is actually labeled Mayer Brothers Rockingham Pottery, reflecting, obviously, James's presence in the business and, the, of course, the main line of production at that time. The image on the right is uh, an Arsenal Rebecca at the Well teapot fragment recovered from an archaeological dig that we will discuss a bit later on. This pattern, by the way, was produced by literally dozens of potteries um, and was one of the best-selling uh, Rockingham designs made in the 19th century. James Mayer not only appears to have provided half the capital for the business, but was himself an accomplished potter and chemist. A contemporary Trenton newspaper reported that <coughs> it was due to his knowledge of the chemistry of color that Arsenal was able to expand into the production of Majolica in 1883. The pottery supported several mills dedicated to the manufacture of pigments to be used for Majolica glazes. Within a few years of launching its Majolica line, the Pottery and Glassware reporter stated that, quote, the colors are much superior to the general run in this class of good. And indeed, the Arsenal glazes at their best are brightly hued, often with a lovely luster. The pictures on the right with their simple lines and crisply molded lily pads display a deep saturated green. More often than not, however, Arsenal Majolica is decorated in tones of brown, such as the example on the left. This is one of a series of fern plates, perhaps inspired by the Victorian <coughs> near obsession with ferns, fern collecting, and botany in general. The preponderance of brown glaze possibly relates to the Rockingham origins of, a, of the fern, but is probably more likely the result of the types of designs that Arsenal specialized in. There are dozens of known jugs, creamers, cus and cuspidors with faux textured tree bark or faux bamboo backgrounds that typically offset a colorful floral or foliate decoration, a depiction of rustic naturalism, if you will, um, and, and with more often than not a very imprecise glaze application. <laughs> Jugs, cuspidors, and jardinere were a noted specialty of the firm's production. And according to an ad from 1893, um, this is what the firm sold most of. And also based on the types of, of, of objects that we see in the current market, this is what we find. Cuspidors or spittoons were pretty much found everywhere uh, in a 19th century home or business. They were made for both men and women uh, in a variety of um, different materials and with varying degrees of, of decoration. This picture, now a well-known arsenal design, um, is what I would call a, a, a tour de force of, of naturalism with its tree bark surface and molded bird's nests embedded into either side. 
Um, the vessel itself is even supported on um, branches that are cut in cross section. And I think this decoration can be characterized as more of an idealized Victorian bird in nature than the Japanese-inspired version that we will see later that were made by Eureka. And just for some context around this curious bird's nest motif, here are some trade cards of the period that use similar imagery, um, advertising everything from metal polish to grain wholesalers. <laughs> Ornithology and the general Victorian interest in natural history resulted in fashions for bird cages in the home, uh, egg collections, and taxidermy. In retrospect, buying a picture with a bird's nest decoration seems kind of quaint compared to wearing a hat with a little bird. <laughs> 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 And while we're on this animal-themed aspect of Victorian popular culture, let's consider Mayer's stag and dog plate, which was available in countless colorways. The subject matter is a quintessential British scene of a stag hunt, though rendered in a much milder, more animal-friendly manner than that of Sir Edwin Landseer's painting on the right. In fact, this subject matter of the hunt, and more specifically, the aftermath of death or violence as, a part of a uh, as part of the natural course of life was commonly depicted in art, literature, and design of the 19th century. This is our death in the dining room moment, <laughs> which was a genius book written by American material cultural culture specialist Ken Ames, but also a very apt phrase uh, that describes this bizarre and disturbingly common use of this type of imagery in Victorian dining room sideboards and in Majolica. The lid of this mint and game pie dish is literally covered in dead animals. A hare, a mallard, a blackbird, lying on a bed of fern and oak leaves. These designs were embraced as the height of fashion, as something that was, that was both beautiful and useful and coveted by those with good taste. And lastly, on the right, I'm showing a, a sideboard made by the Parisian cabinet-making firm of Ford and Watt, which was shown at the Great Exhibition in London <coughs> at, in 1851. The surface is encrusted with carved iconic, iconographic ornament that relates to food and dining. Along with the representations of fruit and vegetables and grains, the central carved panel features a trophy of dead game dominated by a deer carcass. He happens to be upside down, but you can leave him out of <laughs> While the sideboard itself is supported by a group of six dogs symbolizing a hunt. Much more complicated than our little arsenal plate, but I would argue the iconography is consistent. Perhaps more remarkable in terms of its relevance for Majolica is that this sideboard was designed by Hugh Protok, a designer, sculptor, and ceramics modeler who worked for both Minton and Wedgwood, producing a range of Majolica designs into the early 1870s. <coughs> Joseph Mayer exhibited Majolica and Rockingham Wear at the World's Industrial Cotton Centennial, held in New Orleans in uh, 1884. This exhibition was organized to celebrate the city of New Orleans and to mark the 100th anniversary of the nation's first shipment of cotton. It opened in what is now Audubon Park after a series of scandalous delays, um, construction and construction issues relating to the leaking roof of the main exhibition building. And this is a stereoscopic view of a few of the exhibitors, sadly no Majolica here, um, but a great document of the internal structure of the building. Although it was conceptually modeled after the centennial exhibition, uh, exhibition in Philadelphia, it received only a fraction of the total number of visitors and was considered a huge financial failure. As a result, 
It has never been thoroughly assessed by historians. Arsenal's showpiece for this exhibition um, was a large Majolica glaze, uh, a Majolica glazed vase, originally molded with han two handles on either side. Uh, the decoration reflected the cotton-based theme of the exhibition. If you look closely, you can see a detail of riverboats and cotton, and cotton, cotton yes. bales. And my assumption is, is that the leafy green around each scene is, um, is a cotton plant. This piece was cons conspicuously marked and in essence celebrated Arsenal's growing reputation and prosperity at the time. For in a span of only three years, from 1880 to 1883, the firm grew from a work crew of only 20 males plus 10 children to a staff of about 80, including 30 decorators. So clearly the move to producing the Jalga was a good one. <coughs> Which brings me to a story of mistaken identity relating to Joseph Mayer that has been published elsewhere. During this period of intense growth, in 1881, another mayor pottery was established in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania for the, uh, for the manufacture of ironstone china. This firm was founded by a Joseph Mayer and brothers Arthur and Ernest. Surprisingly, however, this is not our Joseph Mayer. According to the census records, he had no brothers named Arthur and Ernest. According to the credit reports, he was not particularly liquid in 1881. And in his obituaries, both in the Crockery and Glass Journal and the Trenton Evening Times, there was no mention of any affiliation in a Beaver Falls pottery. Mayor's Arsenal pottery also exhibited in the 1893 Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. This display was organized by the U.S. Potters Association where the firm showed Majolica along with a variety of Toby jugs or pitchers so well modeled that they were described as, quote, frequently mistaken for antique examples of English origin. <laughs> it's unclear, however, whether any of Arsenal's Tobys were actually finished with Majolica <clears throat> glazes. This is another marked ironstone example, and it is decorated with a polychromed enamel surface. The Arsenal pottery was described in 1887 as being, quote, completely equipped in every respect with the most improved machinery, appliances, and general appurtenances. In fact, we know that Mayer held at least five patents relating to ceramics manufacture, three of which were specific to the process of jiggering. The, insur the insurance map details the site from 1890 annotating the function of each building on the property and the location of the four brick kilns. The adjoining structures to the kilns, sorry, here particularly, were the, um, was the space that was used mostly for the production of the goods. Um, the large space below or west of the kilns is actually labeled um, as jigger rooms and decorating and biscuit shop. And there was also an additional large building here facing Shank Street that, was, um, prov that provided space for additional decorators. While well, ironstone wares from the arsenal were marked, its majolica was not beyond an occasional freehand number painted on the bottom of the wares by its decorators who were being paid by the piece. <coughs> the exception to this is this uh, Majolica paperweight or tile that has a molded mare uh, on clearly on the bottom of the undecorated side. Given the lack of an impressed maker's mark, more precise identification of Arsenal Majolica only became possible during the late 1990s as a result of archaeological monitoring conducted by Hunter Research, a cultural resource management firm in Trenton, New Jersey. The project was initiated in conjunction with road work improvements along New Jersey State Route 29. A significant amount of ceramic waste 
dating from the 1880s was uncovered that could definitively be traced to Joseph Mayer's arsenal pottery. Findings were initially published by, by Bill Liebnick in the Potteries of Trenton Society newsletter in the year of 2000, and reviewed several years later in the, in the Majelica Matters newsletter. It's fair to say that Bill's work has been absolutely critical to the understanding of Arsenal and the, part of, and the pottery's production. All of the pieces seen thus far have corresponding shirts that connect the designs to the Mayor Arsenal pottery. There are obviously many more examples beyond those that I've shown. Um, and this now ubiquitous shaggy dog plate, which I had to show because it is a dog. <laughs> <laughs> this particular bisque shirt is worth noting. It is somewhat of an outlier amongst the other known Arsenal Majolica production, given its overt Japanese-inspired reference. The design is composed of a linear sunburst and flying crane motif. And we see this we see this similar design used in, the, in a printed advertisement for the Nippon Mercantile Company, um, versions of which appeared in the Crockery and Glass Journal during the early 1880s. But the more likely design source is the identical platter made by the Staffordshire Pottery of Wardle and Company after a registered design dated October 17, 1876. The Arsenal platter on the left, in real life, it's just a bit smaller than the, uh, the Wardle piece, and the molded decoration not as crisp, which argues strongly that the Arsenal pottery likely made its mold from the Wardle example. Mayer's Arsenal pottery continued production through the turn of the 20th century. During the first quarter of 1902, the pottery was purchased by H. E. Bicknell, or Bicknell, formerly of the American Queensware Company, located in East Liverpool, Ohio. Beyond being one of the most prolific producers of majolica in the country, I think that Joseph Mayer's true legacy in Trenton can be gleaned from the headline of his obituary, in which he is referred to as Happy Joe. <laughs> Unlike the arsenal pottery, for which we have an abundance of primary source material, the, the historical record of the Eureka pottery is notable for its consistent lack of documentation, with most published sources repeating the same few inaccuracies over and over and over again. It has been well established <coughs> that the Eureka pottery was started by Leon Weil, who was born in Philadelphia to German parents. What wasn't known is that Weil had absolutely no pottery experience. And in fact, he had actually been a wholesale liquor distributor in Philadelphia until his business failed in 1879. He inexplicably arrived in Trenton after a period of unemployment and after the death of his youngest child. The first done credit reports for Eureka dates to January and February of 1883. The reporter noted that the capital used to start the pottery was actually secured from his wife, Rebecca, and oddly, his mother-in-law. He further noted that Wiles' business prospects appeared, quote, rather doubtful. <laughs> Three months later, the Crockery and Glass Journal described Eureka as a small but busy establishment located on Mead Street at the corner of Prince. Weil had a single kiln in operation at the time and 20 paintresses at work. We're talking about the pottery being about right here and the arsenal pottery is somewhere around here. So, just so you have an idea. Eureka produced some relatively sophisticated designs. They mostly employed a range of Japanese inspired ornament like this plate embellished with a like, hummingbird and blossoming prunus motif. The design is a wonderful reflection of the burgeoning uh, American interest in Japanese art and design and an expression of popular aesthetic movement taste. 
As a representative source for such, such decoration, this Japanese woodblock print captures the exoticism and the spare asymmetrical design that drove the appeal of Japanism. Both objects display visual and sensual qualities, an active pursuit of beauty, which in essence helped to define the aesthetic movement um, in this period. This vocabulary of ornament was used in a variety of, of media, on textiles, wallpaper, and in other types of ceramics. Um, throughout the 1880s, the International Pottery Company, also in Trenton, produced a, a, a line of white <coughs> granite ware um, and dubbed the design <coughs> Japanica. And as you, if you can look closely, you can see it's got a similar bird and blossoming prunus uh, decoration. The impetus driving the taste for Japanese design in America was the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition. The displays had a huge impact on visitors as the non-Western ornament and the objects themselves appeared so very new and, and exotic. Reviewers spoke of the attention to detail, the quality of the craftsmanship, and the, the use of naturalistic elements in very visually distinctive ways. Books seeking to capitalize and categorize the Japanese aesthetic appeared in great numbers during the 1880s. The example on the left uh, was modeled after Owen Jones's monumental study, The Grammar of Ornament, which was published in 1856. While Moser's book on the right, which is actually just a series of 11 plates, was intended specifically for craftsmen, designers, and decorators to use as reference in their work. It was this type of inexpensive pattern book that really helped to propagate the elements of aesthetic taste to a large audience. In addition to what eventually became a craze for all things Japanese, the Eureka pottery was also undoubtedly influenced by English Majolica employing similar design vocabulary, such as this shorter and bolton Majolica plate with its pebbled surface and bird and fan decoration on the left, um, or this whole crop plate on the right with the flying crane motif and small blossoming branches uh, molded around the rim. Or this Wedgwood Majolica plate, which plays with the bird and fan motif. Eureka also produced this spare Japanesque design using butterflies and a perfectly irregular flowering branch that references this popular Wedgwood design. What's interesting here, I think, is that the modeler providing designs for Eureka clearly had a working knowledge of the current popular English Majolica. And he was able to adapt the designs for the American market or just copy them outright. Eureka's known hollowware in the Japanese taste includes the picture on the left and a two-handled version on the right. Both are decorated, again, with the same bird, along with a molded wicker basket detail at the base. Looking at the glazes here, one can help, cannot help but be sort of impressed by the consistency and the saturation of the Eureka colors. Given Leon Wiles' experience and the small scale of the operation, it's my assumption that the glazing compounds were likely purchased from a specialist glaze supplier, or color maker, as they were known, rather than formulated in-house, as you saw with the Arsenal pottery. This is one reason why making attributions based upon glaze colors can be really problematic, because in a city like Trenton, <coughs> Multiple factories could have had access to the same glazes obtained from the same suppliers. Interestingly, the Eureka picture form is a direct copy of what I presume is an English model. It is unmarked, and one appears in the background of this is English genre painting by Charles Spenceley. Here. Also, if you look closely at the ceramics on the mantelpiece, 
um, there appears to be a Rockingham jug here and a gurgling fish in the center. Mm -hmm. And here's the detail of the bird and basket weave picture, which was a big surprise when I found it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most popular Eureka designs for collectors is this Merry Christmas plate. Using a variation on the Japanese bird and morphing the, the plum blossom branch into a pseudo holly branch, um, the design strikes a wonderful balance between aesthetic movement, taste, and holiday cheer. Weil and the modeler of this plate were obviously in tune with the growing American interest in Christmas merchandising and saw the commercial potential of such a design. In terms of the larger cultural trends relating to Christmas that occurred post-Civil War, um, like Christmas trees, Christmas presents, Christmas cards, the 1870s and the 1880s marked a period in which it became a big business in America, and Eureka was able to capitalize on this. Christmas cards <coughs> became enormously popular in the early 1880s mm -hmm. with the adoption of the chromolithographic printing process, which made it possible to produce greeting cards for the masses. Mm -hmm. The example on the right is a wonderfully quirky example. If you look closely, it's embellished with silk fringe around the edge. And it was printed by uh, Louis Prang, who is often referred to as the father of the American Christmas card. Um, the potpourri jar on the left is the largest known piece made by Eureka and an unusual form for any American factory. My supposition is that it may have been made as a special commission, but um, that requires some further research. Um, it is marked and has the same brown mottled ground on the underside, uh, on, the, on the bottom, as the plate that I showed, showed earlier. The butter dish on the right is also fairly rare and again shows the skill of Eureka's modelers, um, here <coughs> expressing pure Victorian whimsy. The Trenton Directory for 1883 listed only three modelers and four mold makers amongst the countless individuals that self-identified as potters. Given the high quality of Eureka's known design, it would not have been unlikely for Weil to have hired a modeler on a freelance basis to, to produce his initial Majolica designs. By February 1884, one year after he started the business, the Crockery and Glass Journal reported that Eureka had closed mm -hmm. and further noted that Majolica is no more in Trenton, excepting that made at Mayor's Pottery. Okay, now this is the point in the story that all of the published information on Eureka needs to be called into question. Let me introduce Thomas Whitehead. Whitehead was a serial entrepreneur who had been in and out of the pottery business from the early 1870s. The Dunn Credit Reports described his financial standing as, quote, tangled and encumbered. <laughs> <laughs> his significance for us is that Whitehead actually owned the property on the corner of Mead and Prince Streets, which was leased to Weil for the Eureka Pottery. We're talking mm -hmm. here. In addition to being a holder of Trenton Real Estate, Whitehead was the proprietor of the Franklin Pottery, which was located on the same site before Leon Weil had his brief go at Angelica. After Weil's business folded, the property was again occupied by Whitehead, using the Eureka name, but not producing Majolica. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the time the Eureka Pottery closed, the Eureka Porcelain Works opened at an address that was about a block away from Whitehead's property on Clinton, opposite Mead. So we're, I'm sorry, I can't see anything on the screen. 
So this is Clinton. This is the, this is the property. Whitehead's property is here. This is where Eureka was. It's important that you get that. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all of the published sources on the Eureka pottery mention a Noah and Charles Bach as having taken over the business after a while, from 1885 to 1887. <clears throat> this is simply not accurate. The Bachs were the proprietors of the Eureka Porcelain Works at Clinton opposite me, the lower one. Mm -hmm. they, were the, they were occupied that property until February 1886, at which time the pottery was destroyed by fire. Strangely enough, Noah Bach did have business dealings with Whitehead in the late 1870s. This was a short-lived partnership, and notably the credit reporters described Bach as, quote, a thoroughly unreliable man. <laughs> Whitehead's property at the corner of Mead and Prince was eventually purchased by James Lee and Bentley Pope in 1888. Um, and it is their business that is shown on the 1890 map at the corner of Mead and Prince. Okay. Mm -hmm. The rest of the details are a bit too tedious for a lecture. <laughs> I'm sure I probably <laughs> lost all of you already, but they will be fully documented in the exhibition catalog. But I can briefly summarize by saying that given the evidence from the Trenton directories, the Dunn credit reports, the newspaper obituaries, and the maps, and most importantly, a deed transfer on fire file in the Mercer, Mercer County Clerk's Office, <laughs> I can say with certainty that the two different po there were two different pottery sites with similar names and similar addresses that have been conflated over time to produce an extended and false history of the Eureka pottery. Wow. Shocking, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eureka produced Majelica for about one year only. That's it. And yet, there are so many pieces of attributed Eureka pottery currently on the market. And I would argue that there are a couple of good reasons for this. First, some of them might have actually been produced by the Willits Manufacturing Company, also located in Trenton. In fact, one of the earliest references to Majolica in Trenton dates to February 1882, mm -hmm. when the Crockery and Glass Journal reported that the Willits Manufacturing Company is, quote, pushing their Majolica department forward as rapidly as possible. Three years prior, in 1879, the Willits brothers gained control of the Excelsior Pottery Works, located adjacent to the Delaware Raritan Canal. The Willits were very well capitalized and very keen to increase their market share. They invested in infrastructure and expanded their operation from four kilns to 11 kilns. At the time, they had about 260 hands on staff. This insurance map just sort of gives you an idea of the massive scale of, of the business. Giving Majolica a try for Willits was an easy business decision. It was already very popular, it was relatively inexpensive to make, and the firm's physical plant was tooled for high volume. The Willits Weekly advertisement in the September 16, 1882 issue of Crockery and Glass included for the first time a brief mention of Majolica, goods of brilliant color equal to the finest imported. The first published Majolica circular for Willits appeared several months later. Given that Willits did not mark their Majolica, this brief description, the, or these brief descriptions, provide the only documentation we have of the range of designs produced by this factory. You can see they have a common begonia leaf plate to potentially more remarkable objects, such as the fan ice cream set, which is described as including one large double fan dish which may or may not look familiar to some of you here, and 12 small ice creams of a complementary design. 
Although these fan dishes are often attributed to, to Eureka because of their Japanese design references, my supposition is that they are more likely to have been made by Willis. The backs of many of these fan dishes have no discernible marks and a gray wash glaze, not the brown model glaze that is typically found on marked Eureka wares. Now this fan pitcher or jug also has a similar gray underside. Could this possibly be by Willis? Mm -hmm. Fan jugs were, I hope you noticed, on the, the circular were listed. <coughs> this documented English example of identical form and ornament, which we now know was made by the Staffordshire pottery of Shorter and Bolton, mm -hmm. predates the Willis example and thus could have easily been copied. Willits gradu gradually stopped advertising its Majolica by September of 1883 and refocused its efforts on uh, standard white wear lines. Mm -hmm. While this in itself does not prove that the firm ceased Majolica production, it was just no longer a, a commercial priority for them. My estimation is that <coughs> Willits only produced Majolica from the beginning of 1882 through the end of 1883. In the description of Willett's display at the New Orleans Cotton Centennial in 1884, there was a focus on the firm's very exciting Doric dinnerware, pictured here, um, with no mention whatsoever of any Majolica. And while we're in the process of debunking, debunking decades-old Eureka attribution, there is another complication to add to the mix in the form of archaeological evidence. The, Aiken, the Edgefield Aiken Pottery District, which is approximately here, <coughs> on the west central border of South Carolina, has long been known for its production of alkaline glazed stoneware vessels, similar to the example on the right. In 1995, limited archaeological ex excavations were undertaken by the Diachronic Research Foundation a cultural resource management firm in Columbia, South Carolina. The dig occurred in Miles Mills at the site of what was once the South Carolina Pottery Company. Amongst the findings were earthenware shirts with molded decoration, evidence of Rockingham glaze uh, wares, as well as Majolica. But perhaps the most surprising thing that they found are these bisque shirts wow. that form an exact rep replica of the Eureka Merry Christmas plate. Wow. Here is a newspaper notice dating from December 1885 in the Edgefield Advertiser, reporting on the activities of the newly formed South Carolina Pottery Company. The article described not only the types of wares that they produced, but most importantly, identified the practical potters associated with the firm. There was an Arthur Craig of Scotland and a George W. Lawton of none other than Trenton, New Jersey. It appears that Lawton very conveniently brought along some molds from the Eureka pottery with him. <laughs> and while I have not yet been able to link him to a specific pottery, he was listed as a potter in the city directories from the mid 1870s through the early 1880s. Moles were relatively expensive, and when potteries were forced to close, often the moles were sold to recoup some of the losses. The timing of Eureka's closure and Lawton's move to Trenton does support the possibility that such a, trans that such a transaction could have occurred. In addition to the Merry Christmas plate, archaeologists at this site also found shards of the Eureka bird and prunus plate. Please note that the exterior rim on both of these examples is smooth. I mention this because there is a group of plates, comports, and cake stones that resemble this design but with a slight scalloped edge, like the one on the right. And the decorative elements are proportionally larger 
on the one on the right. I would argue that these are probably not by Eureka, as they are made from completely different molds. And they were only in business one year. And furthermore, the scalped edge examples that I have seen anyway um, are not marked and do not have that brown model back. Might these variations be English or perhaps made by Willits or another firm? That's another discovery <laughs> yet to be made. <clears throat> and finally, I leave you with Miss Majelica Dare of Farragut Square who is described here as a collector of china and pottery ware. Um, an amusing segue, I hope, uh, to the notion that collectors of Majolica have played such a critical role in my research process. Um, ceramics by their nature, as you know, are tactile objects, and having the opportunity to handle so many of these wonderful pieces has been my great pleasure, and so I thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Was it was it cheaper or, or? Well, some of the some of the unmarked pieces um, are from factories that were selling wholesale. Mm -hmm. That's one reason. Uh. Um, maybe Ellen could chime in on this. They most likely were on the bigger market, and the American makers were hoping that the buyers thought they were English. Uh. <laughs> if you don't mark something, then. Uh. It, it could easily be English. Yeah. Mr. In, in one of your um, most recent, one of your latest, later examples, you, you said that uh, basically the tenuous mark had been forged and the plate had been forged. I mean, that's what you're insinuating. Eureka. <coughs> Eureka, is that what I said? I'm not Eureka. <coughs> Why would somebody have stolen forged? it? What do you mean by forged? Well, they, they they were not. They were not Eureka, and yet they put a Eureka name. On no, them. nothing was mar nothing was marked in South Carolina. If that's what you're referring to, the South Carolina. Well, now I can't remember. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll take it back. No. Question. Yes. We can talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> um, just in trying to organize information in my in my head, um, Peekskill, Tenuous, and Harrison works. Are they used interchangeably, or are two a subdivision of one? I'm glad you asked that, and I should have probably explained. Um, in the Peekskill directory, it's referred to as Harrison's works, Harrison Peekskill works, Peekskill pottery. It was, not, it was not clear to me exactly what the name of the business was. Um, so I, that's probably something that should be fleshed out. But in addition to that, his um, the one mark that I showed, where it said Harrison's Peak Skill Pottery Works, I would think that that would be his his full name. But I don't know. And just can I ask one other question? Sure, of course. Um, the um, the Rockingham brown glazed versus the um, the when you have the brown and then you have the green on top. Uh, mm -hmm. You showed us some slide, some slides where the brown was the basis for the green design. Mm -hmm. Is the brown still considered to be Rockingham, or because it's decorated <coughs> with the green glaze, it becomes something else? That's an interesting question too. I mean, Rockingham mm -hmm. is earthenware, mm -hmm. and Majolica is earthenware, and I think um, the difference being whether you're using 
pigmented colors on the on the majolica or just brown glaze on the rocking. So I think it comes down to chemistry, but I'm not a ceramic historian. Could somebody help me out, Ellen? <laughs> <laughs> it's the glaze that was on the shelf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some, if you want to, <laughs> there are some, call it one thing or another, I guess you can, but it's just the glaze that was on, the brown glaze that they had. So is it a hybrid, or it becomes no longer blocking him when you add the color glaze? I'm or, not, we're not sure. Well, see, the problem is this, and this, this is part of the problem. Um, the definition of majolica is so imprecise, um, even in other situations beyond whether we're talking about Rockingham or, or whatever. Um, majolica was even written in the, in the trade press as being sort of a farcical term that actually had no meaning whatsoever. So to parse it, is it majolica, is it, is it Rockingham? This was a, like an age-old question from the 19th century. They, they really, they called things majolica and some dealers called things majolica and didn't know why they were calling things majolica, but it was a popular term. It was like a marketing, a marketing aid. Um, and that, again, was, was discussed in the press over and over and over again. So, sorry, that's such a, no, thank you. That's a random <laughs> answer, but. For the exhibition, are you looking at other American potters or just these three? Oh no, we're we're covering all of the American firms that. that <coughs> and we know how of. many are, are those, and can you identify us? Um, well, the most prominent American factory was probably in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, Griffin Smith and Hill, um, and that has a chapter unto itself. Um, there was a fairly large maker in East Liverpool, Ohio, George Morley and Sons, and also other smaller makers, and I'm sure that th those will be touched on as well in, in the chapter with Morley. Um, there is a pottery in New Hampshire, Keene, New Hampshire, called uh, <coughs> New Hampshire Pottery. <coughs> the proprietor's name was J.S. Taft. He's, he marked his works. Um, there was a pottery in Terrytown. Um, unfortunately, we've only been able to find one example, of, marked example of, of, from that pottery, but uh, there was also uh, a pottery. There, I'm getting there, I'm going south. <laughs> um, there was a pottery in New York City. The Carr, um, uh, James Carr. Um, and then in Baltimore, we have uh, Edwin Bennett and D.H. Haynes, the Chesapeake Pottery. Um, am I missing something else? Want to be? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna hold off on that. Oh, the time to ask a question. A question in terms of the difference in quality between, let's say, American majolica and English or European. Was there a distinct difference, or is it just ones from the US and ones from England? Well, I, I, I would think that most collectors would say that the, the English majolica was much more finished and much more sophisticated in terms of design and, and um, in terms of the, the colors of the glazes, and, um, and it was. Um, a lot of a lot of what I show tonight would not be touched by a lot of people who are <laughs> who are collectors of English majolica. Um, but I, I I almost feel like it shouldn't. They're like apples and oranges. It's um, they're different markets. Um, and, and just to say, I think at a lower level, the English made just as bad things. To Ellen's previous yeah. point, that um, people might have bought things thinking they were English. Yes. Um, is there a sense in the sort of historical sort of development of American majority when um, it's seen as American? You know, I mean, the, 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 
the no. Americans well, sort of own I this think, land? I think or, that, or is that irrelevant? Is that, it, it didn't ever come into play. I think that these smaller potteries are, they scream American. I mean, that's, I think the Harrison works yeah. were just so, they almost resemble folk, folk art. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's so individualistic and idiosyncratic that it could only be American. Right. I don't know. I mean, um, I do know that some people, when they see Eureka Ware, they, they're surprised they're surprised to find out that it was made in Trenton, New Jersey. So, <coughs> yeah. I was just struck by the the, the, the stag hunt. Mm -hmm. Thinking, what possible relevance does this have <coughs> right. to someone in Trenton? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, was the cost of the American made majority much less for the consumer than the English? I think it must have been um, because the uh, the tariffs that were placed on mm -hmm. imported wares were so steep in order to foster the, the industry that it, you know, it must have been. And was Rockingham Ware being made concurrently with the Majala? Yes, yes. Since glazes were such a highly regarded secret, where did the Americans get their glaze? Did they import it? Did they manufacture it or make their own? Well, I think in terms of the Peekskill pottery, for example, um, it's my assumption that he probably made those glazes. And we've, we know that there was a lot of back and forth between those potters that arrived here, writing back home saying, you know, can you send me that recipe for that glaze? Or this is, this is my situation with the, with the clay. Can you help me out? You know, there was a lot of cross currents back and forth. Um, and the, the occurrence of, of glaze suppliers from England coming to America and just selling the pigments ready made. Okay. Mm -hmm. How much of the exhibition will focus on American and versus European? Uh, the vast majority will be English. English. But, right. but we will. I mean, we're trying to. We're trying to focus on the American work because it has not been treated in a scholarly way ever. And, um, and we found out some really, really interesting things, I mean, beyond what I've just presented tonight. So um, it's, it's just as important. It might not look as pretty, but it is just as important. Yeah? But the, so the exhibit won't have um, Spanish pieces or any other? Mm -hmm. It'll be no, we're English. focusing on, we're focusing on English and Ameri American mm -hmm. wares. Okay. It was, the, the scope was way too, large to, to do a comprehensive, thorough job to include the European race. One last question. Would you say you are beginning to find a stylistic uh, difference between <coughs> English Majolica and American Majolica, particularly within certain companies? Did you see an American voice beginning to develop? Before it was I think I think Joseph Mayer really captured um, you know a rustic American aesthetic mm -hmm. in his wares um, that everything had that sort of um, bark-like surface and he made so much of it. I mean, obviously we see it on eBay everywhere. It's you know you can't get away from it. <laughs> it's, um, well, well, it would be like divining tea leaves. But would you think that had Majolica, the Majolica craze lasted longer? Do you think that they would have developed into two distinct styles, American Majolica and English Majolica? Do you think that's possible? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what you're asking, but. Um, you know, Majolica was, we, call, we talk about <coughs> the Majolica becoming so unpopular in the 1880s, but here, it was just getting started. The party was just starting. So, I mean, they, people were buying Majolica here through the 90s. Um, so it was, I, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're asking, but I, I think that, um, each factory certainly had a distinctive style to it. Whether it reflected any sort of Englishness is another story. I mean, 
the Griffin Smith and Hillware was was copying That's so what, many so many Wedgwood pieces, yeah, yeah. yeah, and Haynes as well, right? So okay, the very final question. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find in exploring the Arsenal or the Mirror pieces that most of the backs were sponge, like the dog plates? Yes, yes. Um, I know that the the um, bird's nest picture is you know it has a cream base on it, but most of the things that I've experienced have that distinctive sponged back. Yes, yes, definitely. But there's some British firm, mm -hmm. secondary firms yeah. that have the same. But they're not the same. They, they look a lot alike, but they're not the same. Sponge. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. <laughs> the mare pieces have a real different look than the other sponge pieces. Well, on that note, um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, Laura, for a very <laughs>